Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 77. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find both of us on Twitter uh, at tidy underscore explained. Or you can hit us up on Gmail, tidy.explained at gmail.com. Or you can take out an issue on the uh, GitHub uh, repo, as a few have. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can um, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, like, and leave a comment or a question or uh, a, a, you know, a disagreement, and um, we can uh, <laughs> go from there. We can put it on the air. Yeah, yeah. We we love hearing from you all. We love getting emails. Love getting comments. Uh, it lets us know that we're doing a good job. Uh, so that, yeah, please definitely subscribe. So this week we're going to start a new series. We just completed our databases uh, in our series. Now we're starting a new one. What are we doing, Patrick? Yeah, so we we did a kind of a, a broad machine learning sort of classification series several weeks, maybe months ago now on baseball pitches. And, um, you know, we worked through a bunch of different models and all that stuff. And one of the things that we did not do when we did that was we didn't use tidy models and tidy models is sort of the new uh, in vogue way to um, scale up machine learning models within R. And, um, you know, we used some of the normal classification packages. We used carrot a little bit, which is the precursor to what tidy models is. Mm -hmm. So we really thought, man, it'd be cool if we learned more about tidy models because we haven't really been using it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to jump in with two feet uh, and we're going to start today by just going over sort of a basic introduction of tidy models and the broom package. And so um, tidy models is sort of going to be our, our, our suite of packages and, and a framework for our, our machine learning pipeline. And we'll iteratively build on that over the weeks. And then the broom package is a just super handy way to, um, you know, get away from the kind of base R, basic ways of looking at the model outputs and putting it into a clean like data frame that is easy to look at or report out in a table if you're writing a paper or putting it together in a, in a markdown file for colleagues or something like that. Exactly. Like it really simplifies the process. It kind of takes what you're going to do anyway. It like because everyone does the same stuff all the time with the model. Yeah. Like once they create the output, they, you know, print the summary, but you always want to take out some values in there and then you got to suss it out. So it really simplifies yeah. that process. Uh, yeah. So I will share the screen now so Patrick can see what we're talking about. I will open up our studio and we will get going from there. All right. So we can start this off. We're using an R markdown file to help organize all our thoughts. And we have then a header here that describes what, what's going on here. Uh, we have, all right, here's the packages that we're using. So tidy models in broom, um, just a very high level explanation of those. And then we get into our actual code itself. So here we have our set up chunk uh, that is, you know, surprise setting things up. So we have library tidyverse for our data manipulation needs, uh, tidy models. So like tidyverse, tidy models is actually a bunch of different packages that all get loaded in with tidy models. And it really, once again, simplifies the process for you. Uh, broom for uh, cleaning up our models. And then Laman, the that is actually going to contain the data that we're going to be using this week. For plotting, we set the theme. So this is from ggplot theme set. We're going to set the theme to be theme light because we like the way that looks. It's very clean. Uh, so that way we don't have to set the theme for every single plot there. And then we do some initial uh, data cleaning for us to be using in our models later on. So we have this batting data set from Lum. Here, let me run everything else so we can see that. So batting is a rather um, not a pretty long data set. It's got, you know, I mean, it goes all the way back. 000. I think it's, I think it's up through 2016 updated so far. I, I don't know. You could do a table of the um, year ID, year ID and we could see yep, through 2020. 2020. Okay, so we're good through this season. So it is a rather long. Obviously, the more historic that you go, the you could see how sparse some of those things weren't collected, or you know, no, nobody was sitting there collecting some of those things, but um, he was tracking that, but it's all good. It's pretty big, pretty big data set. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do is we're going to take that. We're going to join it with people. We're going to use an inner join. What inner join is going to do is it's going to take all this 
in this situation, since we didn't specify the column names, it's going to say, okay, what column names are the same between the, the data set people, which let's quickly print that as well. So this will, this has, you know, also a bunch of information, but the one that's going to be matching on is player ID and add that on to batting, but only the cases where it exists both in people and batting. We're mm -hmm. going to do another inner join with awards players. Which I actually don't know what that one is. That's going to be like whether a guy won an MVP or so uh, what's an all-star. Um, we won't use that in this example here. Um, I just kind of put that in there to set it up as like maybe future when we get into classification, it'd be like classifying, you know, an MVP based on hitting statistics and things like that. Gotcha. Okay. So it's also going to be add, add the benefit of really reducing the number of players that are in our data set here. So it's not just like got a bunch of random players in there that played one inning or one game. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then we're also going to then going to filter. We're going to keep anybody that's played since 2000 since or during 2006 and yep. then any time any players that have less than 300 at bats once again that's to remove some variants of players that didn't play all that much yeah, yeah. and so, so that, this is a very um discrete population that we're looking at yes so let's uh do dim on that so we ha now have 564 rows and 50 columns of data and now we should always visualize your data before you actually go to do anything. And what we're going to care about in this episode here is hits versus RBIs. So we're going to plot using the base R plot function. Uh, the H stands for hits and the RBI is runners batted in. Let's take a quick peek at that. It looks pretty standard. It doesn't look like it looks like there's a trend related. It looks like there, you know, yeah. some, some correlation there, uh, but nothing is really jumping out to me that's like whoa that we're going to need to handle that yeah and part of it is the function of this the, the you know we've we've pared the data down to you know players with over 300 at bats players that have run one award so generally if you're getting more hits you're probably in a position to drive more runners in uh, anyway so we see we see that here as hits go up generally there's a you know, some sort of linear increase in your ability to generate runs for your team as well. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I alluded to that before, but this week we're going to be looking at what is the likelihood of an RBI given hits. And so we're going to use a standard linear model to do this initially. And so we use the LM function from the stats package in that comes with R. Uh, we're going to create a formula, which is left-hand side, tilde, right-hand side. So RBI is our dependent variable, um, and it's going to be dependent on whatever's on the right-hand side. In this case, we only have one variable, each, and this is hits. And so these are two column names inside of the data set baseball. Uh, so you can kind of just write out the column names. It's actually pretty nice to be able to do that. And then we set our data to be baseball, and then we run it, and it runs a linear model for us. But up, but da There we go. And now we got our um, our basic linear model. This is the basic print that happens here, but typically you won't just be looking at that. We will be looking at the output of summary, which gives us a lot more information, such as we can see that H is actually got a p-value uh, that's very small. <laughs> it's less than 2e to the negative 16, so it would be considered highly significant. So it is highly predictive of RBIs. Um, and same with intercept. So uh, it's basically expecting all these players without having gone to hit <laughs> have 34, uh, 34 RBI just by being. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're... Uh, uh, an argument for uh, scaling your um, scaling your predictors. The, the <laughs> other thing is again we we've delimited our data set to players that had over three hundred hits. So uh, we could keep everybody and scale the predictors. Maybe we'll do that in a in a future episode and go through what scaling does uh, or transforming some of those predictors. Mm -hmm. And the power of tidy models. But we just wanted to show you, this is like the old school, I don't want to say old school, the um, the way that you would do this if you're just doing a linear model using R yeah. pre-tidy models. Doing, doing stats for a paper or something like this, you'd run this linear model, you'd have your outputs, you'd probably dump it out into a table and um, you know, interpret the, the hits coefficient and interpret the rig, uh, residual standard error of the model and, and the multiple R squared. And, you'd, you know, you'd go through some of those um, um, basic uh, model summary statistics and, and explain those. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but if we're trying to set up a pipeline for utilizing um, models in operation, uh, we probably, you know, that's not a super useful output. <laughs> yeah. Also, we could only run this one model. Correct. Yeah. So we'd have to, if we wanted to do a random forest regression, uh, we'd have to load the ranger package or the random forest package and do that. We'd have to load a bunch of uh, uh, different packages to make it work. Tidy models is going to allow us a framework to streamline that process. So let's get into that now. Patrick, do you want to take us through the tidy models method of doing this now? Yep. So in the tidy models method, uh, the first thing that you're going to need to do is initialize the type of model or models that you want to run. So here we're going to initialize a linear model. Um, So we set up linear reg is the function there and we pipe in, we're going to set the mode to regression. This wasn't strictly necessary here. Actually, you could remove that step because we're setting the engine to LM. There's really only one choice there. Uh, If we were using a model that did in fact have multiple choices, like a a decision tree could be a classification or regression model. We'd want to set the mode to regression instead of classification since we're predicting um, or we're regressing a continuous variable onto dependent variables, in this case, one dependent variable. So we just leave that in uh, for for clarity, but it's it's not 100% necessary. Uh, There is absolutely nothing to see here. It's not even that fun when you run this chunk of code. It just says, hey, you set up a linear model. Great. Now we actually have to do something. So we're going to fit the model. So we're going to set up that linear model that we initialized, and we're going to use the fit function. And the syntax now inside of there is exactly the same as what Ellis ran in the original base R linear model. Uh, So we were saying we want to regress RBIs on hits using our data baseball. And now we we essentially have the same thing. If we run fit LM, we're just going to get the coefficients fit back out to us and we're gonna get the call of the model that we actually ran, which is right there. And so we now wanna summarize this model. So how are we gonna do this? In the tidy model framework, we're gonna take that call and we're gonna pluck out the fit from it. So this is where the model lives. And we're just gonna get it reported as a summary. And now we see the same old, same old version as we did before. There's nothing different here. The coefficients are the same. It's the exact same model. Literally, it outputs the same. Literally, the same output. We did the exact same. But let's um, let's try and tidy this up. So that right there is looks fine. But if you were like going to print this out, let's say to a table or something in a markdown file, you're working with um, colleagues on a project. Let's make this nice. So we're going to use the broom package, which broom cleans things up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our fit lm. We're going to use this handy tidy function, and you can see that it took the estimates uh, or the the uh, model coefficients and dumped them out into this nice table. Now it's a two by five matrix, and we can do things with this, right? We can save it to a table, we can put it into a DT table in a, in a shiny app or a markdown file. We could call certain columns of this table in a much easier way if we wanted to use them. So, for example, let's say we manually wanted to build a regression model, we could do um, we could call estimate uh, for intercept and, and get that value out. and Or we could call the um, estimate, the, the beta coefficient, which is the estimate for hits, and we could use that to say like weight hits in a different kind of model or something like that. So we can easily call these things and pull them out. No, I'm doing that wrong. Oh. How would I want to do this? Eh, let's not worry about that. I think this, oh. this is how you pull the estimates out, and then it would be. I think you need a bracket and then a two, isn't it? Or either that, or you need uh, to pipe and then a dot bracket two or something like that. I think it is. There it is. Yeah. Times ten. So that would be. I would expect yeah, yeah. three point four additional RBI per ten. Per ten. Uh, so yeah. So if you were scaling up the variables. Yeah. So that's cool. Okay, what else can we pull? Uh, well, what else can we do with the broom package? Well, broom also gives us this cool glance function, uh, which now this gives us some of that information that was at the bottom of the summary table. So the things like the model p-value, uh, the adjusted r squared, the r squared, uh, the degrees of freedom of the model, which is one because we have one predictor, the AIC, the BIC. So it gives us a bunch of information. Um, specific to the model uh, statistics, which can be useful if 
again, let's say we wanted this in a table. Um, and let's say we were, we, let's say we built several different regressions. We could put this all, we could stack them together and bind them in rows in a table that we could show out to colleagues and discuss the differences. Uh, what else can we do? Um, well, the augment function is a really handy one in, in tidy, uh, in, in broom, sorry. This actually takes the original data set and it plops in the fitted values. So those are the predicted values on the original data set and the residuals. Then it gives us some model checking information where we could you know, try and find residuals that are perhaps outside of the norm that might have a lot of leverage on the model that maybe we consider them to be weird outliers that are influencing the model in a strange way, or maybe data was recorded incorrectly and this model uh, or this, uh, uh, you know, one of the observations is having a negative influence on the model. We might need to clean it up. So mm -hmm. the augment function is like a really useful one because now the residuals are right there. We could like plot the residuals. We could build a histogram of the residuals, like all kinds of um, cool things that would uh, uh, allow us to, um, oh, there you go. Yeah. And resid. Is, uh, is, we plotted against anything else? No, we could do like a histogram. So you could do like, uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. See? So it's nicely distributed. So. Right. So that's kind of cool. Uh, what else? Okay. So now that we have those models, remember when we use that tidy function, remember what it does here. If we run it, it pulls that data in a cool table. So now we don't have to actually use that summary table, that the original summary table. That's really ugly to pull these things out. We can literally get this in a two by five table. And now we can do some plotting. So here, what we do is we take the uh, that tidy table, and we're going to do some ggplot of the actual coefficients with their representative standard errors. So the two columns that we're going to be using are estimate and the uh, the term. So First the term columns. is basically whether it's the intercept and and whether it's the hit, the, the uh, independent variable. We're going to make those a point. So we're going to kind of make them sort of big and we're going to put the error bars on by using the standard error. So here we're just going to use the standard error. We could have done two times standard error, um, but here we're just doing one standard error. It's an error bar plot. We're doing the width at zero because I don't want it to look like the uh, Star Wars fighter pilots with the wide ends. Um, I can't stand that. And size 1.2, we're making it a little thicker. And then we're doing a facet wrap. The only reason I did this is because you can see right down there that the estimates are on kind of like wildly different scales. So 34.7 and 3.4, and it, it's actually drowning out the standard error around hits. Um, our option there is that we could actually take that estimate of 3.4 and do something like multiply it by 30 and then increase, you know, put our hits on a per 30 basis. But here we get our, um, our uh, model errors. I expand the limits down to zero because obviously uh, if it was crossing zero, then we would have a, a insignificant model. We would have, uh, put it this way, let's remove the significant and insignificant. We would have a model that has uncertainty consistent with the fact that it could be both negative and positive. So yeah. in this case, we don't. So that's why I set our, our expanded limits to zero. And then the bottom part is just some basic kind of prettying it up. I wanna make the um, background on the the facet uh, titles black and, and I want to bold the words within them. Um, and I that's don't this, want uh, this piece up here to be clear. Correct. The, the I don't need a y axis because that the text on the y axis is redundant with the headers within the facet. And then I'm just doing a little bit of um, prettying up on the x axis to make it bigger and bold. And so there we go. Cool. There you go. So Very nice. Now we have our um, a cool little uh, uh, picture of our. A nice little bit. Our estimates. And that was all because we could use that tidy function from the broom package, which put that ugly summary output into a nice little table. Boom, boom. Okay. What else can we do? How about making predictions? You want to go through this a little bit? Sure thing. So we're going to create a fake data set for uh, our models just so that we can have, without putting any players in there, and we can just see how the, the model is going to behave. And so we can demonstrate that as well. So we're going to set our seed to be 11. And because we're using a random process, we want to set our seed so it's reproducible. Uh, we're going to create a tibble that's going to have a couple different elements here. So first we're going to have well, two elements here. Uh, player. And so we're going to give player the, a name that is a letter between a through uh, J. And so <laughs> the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. 
um, and then H is gonna be hits. And remember, this is the predictor that we used in our model, so we need to have that in order to then produce some sort of potential output. Um, here we're going to be generating this from a random uh, normal distribution. So we're going to use the rnorm function. We're going to set n. So this is the, uh, the number of numbers we want out from this predictor here. We want 10 of those numbers for the 10 players we have. We're going to set the mean to be 220. So that is going to be the, uh, for our normal distribution, that'll be the mean value. and Have a standard deviation of 100. These were yeah. just set by us. Yeah, and there is one thing I will say about this that I just noticed that I wrote when I, when I wrote that little silly simulation. If you remember, we delimited our data to players that had hits greater than 300, was it? Yeah. Or was it at bats greater than 300? At, at bats. Oh, okay. I wonder what the, yeah, at bats. I wonder what the average hits were within that population uh, of our hit, of the ones that made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so these are going to be stellar players. Yeah, one one hundred sixty-eight is okay. Okay, not so, not so bad then. It, it's within the. It's we're, within we're, the we're, uh, error. we're predicting some. Uh, yeah, big all-star big players. all-star <laughs> players right here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we're gonna round. Uh, so. Here, I'll just run this. I will have to rerun my seed, but see how it generates 10 random numbers based on this normal distribution. So it pretty, makes the distribution, randomly selects 10, 10 values out of it. But we hits are an integer, so we want to round them to zero. And so we will call round there. And so we can re, let me rerun the seed, rerun that. So now we have, oh, I ran that twice. Now we're in baseball data. So now we have a new data set that we can run through our model to uh, see how these new players that we pulled in, how how we what we could predict from them. And so mm -hmm. player A had like 161 hits, B 223. So all-star player E is just off the charts. <laughs> Same with G. And G, yeah, 352. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we'll, the way that you do this is similar to how you do it in, in the past, too, where you'd use the predict function. for um, You feed in the model, and then you feed in the new data that you have here. And so you can run that. And these are the estimates that our model has uh, from being fit on the prior data set of the RBIs that we could expect from these different players here. Um, so it just it outputs those. Uh, we can also change the type of output. So normally it just gives us a prediction, but we maybe want something else. Maybe we want a confidence interval. So we can still use the same predict function, but then we set the type to be conf int and set the level of confidence to 95% or 0. Or you can set it to pred int if you want a prediction interval. There's lots of, uh, there's a few options within that. Yeah. So there we go. So there you go. So this would be the lower and higher estimates that you could get from your model as to what you could be fairly confident the model will return. Mm -hmm. And so now we could do this and do a comparison between uh, actual and not. So we can use this new baseball data. No, excuse me. When, if we want to combine our actual prediction versus the range, that mm -hmm. is when we take the baseball data, which is, remember, the player in hits. We're going to bind calls. So this is going to add on the new data set that we have here, which is from the predict. Then we're going to bind calls again, and this is going to be the confidence interval. So this mm -hmm. is going to bind them all together to produce player hits, the predicted RBI in the lower and upper uh, range of what we might expect from RBI from our stellar players. So now we can plot this. So we're going to take baseball, that same the same data set we have here. We're going to rename them to give them nicer names so that it's just easier to handle when we're writing out our plots here. So pred RBI is, we're gonna ch ch change dot pred to be that, the lower 95 from dot pred lower and high 95 from dot pred upper. We're gonna generate a GG plot. Uh, we're gonna set the aesthetics to be X is the predicted RBI and Y is gonna be setting the order uh, based on the predicted RBI. So that way we get a nice range where they're not like jumping all over the place with, okay, this player's here, this player's here, this player, it's actually gonna uh, have a nice uh, ascending manner there. 
We're going to add the error bars there with our um, X min and X max to be our low and high, 95%. Uh, once again, don't want Star Wars, don't want uh, TIE Fighters. TIE Fighters, <laughs> that's what it was, yeah. Uh, we are setting it to be a little bit thicker, so the not line is, is uh, very clear. Uh, and then we're going to add the points over that. Uh, I think since we're setting the fill to be white, that's why we did it in this order, where we put down the error bars and then plop on the, uh, the point over that. I'm going to say the size is four, so it's actually going to be a rather large circle. Shape is 21, which is an empty circle that can have a fill. The fill is going to be white, and the color is going to be black. So, ba -da -ba -da, here we go. So Yay. these are the players that we have randomly generated. You could always do this on a real data set as well, and so you'd have the actual players you care about. And this is the predicted RBI, so then you can kind of rank them and do what you want to do for your fantasy or whatever. Hmm. <laughs> but there you go. That is how you can go from a simple model, how you might apply it with linear, a basic LM from uh, base R or stats uh, R to now moving over into this world of tidy models. Uh, I think it's pretty cool because it's more of an engineering and more of a building up the process as you go, which will make it much more, um, you can apply more things to it and you can just now apply a different model as opposed to having yeah. to redo the entire process, all your pre-processing. Or having to do the process in a different package. You know, if we were to do a random forest again, we'd have to load a random forest pa package and, and write the model and all that stuff. And sometimes even extracting um, model outputs is different. But it, if you go back to our uh, machine, our uh, classification um, uh, series, you know, extracting models was like totally different depending on which package you used in the summary that that model package provided. But here, we could easily scroll back up to the top and change this to a decision tree or change it to something else. And that's really going to be the goal over the next uh, bit of series here is is us getting into um, us getting into tidy models and trying to show how to kind of stream streamline a model building pipeline. Yep. And, and, and figuring it out with you. So we are learning it just ahead of you. We're trying to explain it to you. If we get something wrong, please let us know. Uh, we, we, uh, we're learning. So with that, I guess we can call it. So thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, as always, my name is Els Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Els underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And Tidy Explained is on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore Explained. And Tidy Explained is also on Gmail at tidy.explained at gmail.com. Uh, you can go on the GitHub repo and take out an issue if there's something you'd like to see us add or do, maybe with Tidy Models. Um, or you can like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. And uh, we would greatly appreciate hearing from you. Yeah. Thank you all so much and keep on exploring your world.